Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 204 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of MichaelBoylesStrengthCoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try StrengthCoach.com out for three days for just a buck, and if you'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net, it's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Check it out at StrengthCoach.com. I'm your host, Anthony Rand, and the show notes are located at StrengthCoachPodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to StrengthCoachPodcast at gmail.com. Com. All right, for our big sponsor, Perform Better, they're having the Spend More, Save More offer right now. 10% off when you spend $50 to $100, 15% off when you spend between $100 and $150, and 20% off when you spend $150 or more. Some exclusions do apply, so check it out. Don't forget, too, the Orlando Summit coming up in June has the early bird price ending next week. It's going to go from $289 to 359 so register now. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about reevaluating his warm-up based off of some of the high heart rates we saw in his new product, Complete Sports Conditioning, and the videos, It's Not How Much, It's How Fast, as well as Rear Foot Elevated Split Squat with a band. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. For the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove is on to talk about managing your money. For the Functional Movement System segment, Kyle Kiesel is on to talk about using the FMS for injury prediction. And on the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment, I have on Mark Fitzgerald, Strength Conditioning Coach for the Anaheim Ducks. He's on to talk about the transition he made from going from the AHL to the NHL, building trust with players, the technology he's using with the Ducks, the research he's doing on data for his Masters, evaluating hockey talent versus athleticism, hockey testing, and nutrition. That and much more coming up with Coach Fitzgerald. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Anthony. How are you? All right, well, uh, we're, we're doing this, we're recording this on Thursday, the, your new product, uh, complete sports conditioning came out uh, on Monday. Gotten some great feedback. A lot of talk about it. Um, we, you know, we went over a bunch of questions that I had on on uh, Monday about it. Uh, but I got a question for you. Uh, as you know, I told you last time, and and you know, before we we're talking, my favorite part, and I think you're getting a lot of great feedback with the 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 real time warm up with the heart rate monitors, and we can see what's going on. Um, but one question that I had was, and I was wondering if you were starting to question yourself, is do you feel like the warm-up, um, that, you know, the heart rate was much higher than I think you thought it was going to be, right? Um, it seemed like what you were saying early on during some of the warm-up, like, wow, we got the heart rates up. And then you had um, the, the series of, like, slams, 10 slams, 10 side throws, and, you know, 10 jump to the box. There was some heart rates up there in the 170s. My question for you is, uh, even with the lean fall run, like heart rates are on the, on the high side. My question for you is, how, did you reevaluate? Did you look at that and say, man, these are high heart rates. And, um, you know, we're always talking about, oh, you know, people should be really fresh for power. Um, the reps should be, you know, four to six, get really good um, uh, quality movements in here. But if they're getting that fatigued, are they getting the quality that they need to get? Have you thought about reevaluating uh, some of this piece of the warm up? No, I think I thought about my staff needs to get in shape because <laughs> you know what's funny is that i'm always on them from a conditioning standpoint because one of the things you realize and that's sort of a, a half sarcastic answer but i do think that this the staff does not tend to do the conditioning that the athletes do and i'm always on the staff about making sure that they're doing the running and that they're getting on the bike more not so that they're in shape but from an experiential standpoint so you all always are kind of knowing how this feels because one of my great criticisms of coaches in the past have been people prescribing these God awful workouts that they've never done and never having that sensation. And one of the things that I did 
all through my time at BU is that I ran every single conditioning workout that we did. Sometimes I would run them twice in a day, but I would always run them at least once. So that if something was horrible or was wrong and I realized, okay, this is totally off the mark, I could uh, fix it the next time and realize that, okay, this, this wasn't right. So I do think that they like, because I was basing it off and I wish I'd had, if my hockey girls had been there, you would have seen it almost exactly the way that it should have been, which would have been everybody between like 120 and 140. And I was actually kind of surprised that some of the staff people were popping up. Like you said, you know, there was some 150s, 160s, 170s. And it was like, whoa, if I hadn't, if I'd had heart rate monitors on everybody and it had been a real workout instead of a demonstration, I would have probably slowed everything down. I would have said, hey, you know, let your heart rate drop down, take your time. But I wanted people to see that in something that we would look at and think, hey, this is a, like a little speed power workout. This isn't conditioning. This isn't, there can't be any conditioning effect or low level aerobic effect or anything like that in this type of work. And yet when you see it, you can't deny that, as you said, the intensity was probably higher than one than what was perceived and two than what was planned. And so it wouldn't make me reevaluate as much what I was doing um, from a training standpoint, except for the fact of making sure that you're telling everybody, you know, you got to take your time. That's why one of the reasons we did it the way that we did it was we found that, you know, if we did sprints, let's just say we were going to do six tens or six twenties or whatever it was, people would, Sprint up, sprint back, sprint up, sprint back. They would do six sprints in, you know, in a minute. And when we wanted six sprints in six minutes at one per minute, and we found that, okay, if we throw a couple med ball exercises in between, we can slow it down. So what we're seeing, though, is that there's a big circulatory effect that's being produced by this, even though no one perceived any muscular effect. No one looked at us and thought, wow, my legs are burning. Or boy, I'm breathing heavy. Yeah. But it, because when you like you look at that, whatever the med ball circuit say we were doing, it's sort of like okay, there's a you know there's an anterior core orientation from a slam. There's a rotary emphasis from the rotational throws. There's an upper body kind of chest pass emphasis, uh, and then there's a, a lower body power from a jump and a sprint. But we're moving that around, and you almost get. It was something that they used to talk about. I wrote about it years ago called peripheral heart action circuits. And the idea with peripheral heart action circuits was exactly what you saw happen. And it goes back. This is I'm getting uh, I'm going old school history on you. But Bob Guida, G-A-J-D-A, was an old bodybuilder. I think actually was a Mr. America probably maybe in the 60s. And he was a big fan of these peripheral heart action circuits where the basic idea was that you sort of you don't fatigue any body part yet you keep this kind of continuous loop, you know, where somebody's thinking, wow, you know, there's a big demand on my kind of rotary core muscles. Now there's a big demand on my, my pecs. Now I'm doing slams and there's more of a demand on like, you know, my, my lats and my anterior core muscles. Then I'm running a sprint and there's a big demand on my, you know, quads, glutes, hamstrings, but nobody's getting fatigued yet. There is this sort of weird cardiovascular effect that's happening. And, his thing was that you could basically weight train. Like with him, it wasn't med ball stuff. It wasn't explosive. It was all weight training. But it was kind of this idea that we were going to do like, you know, an upper body exercise, a lower body exercise, then a core exercise, then another upper, then a lower, then a core. And that's the way I always designed my circuit training for strength when I did it. But we don't do that all that much. And we kind of did the same thought process with the med ball stuff, but never really envisioning that it would be uh, – you know, it would kind of be what it was. Yeah. Well, I you know I get that, like you said, with the hockey girls. But even, you know, newer athletes. I mean, because obviously, I mean, your interns and your staff, I mean, those they're not in their 30s general pop. They're still, they were all in pretty good. Right. And that's, look at them, yeah, so. so I guess my thing would almost be that, you know, it's kind of a, a good, and this is where I think we talked about this, but we met with, um, I met with Clyde Hart, who was Michael Johnson's coach. And one of the things that he had talked about was the fact that you could get some fitness work, quote unquote, out of your warm up if you did your warm up right. And that's kind of what, you know, I think you can go back sort of on the uh, 
on the old forum threads when Joel's cardiac output stuff was first coming out. And both Devin and I said, I think we're getting that by accident. And then I started looking at the heart rates of the hockey girls and realizing, wow, I am getting this. I'm getting this kind of 10 minutes of jogging, but I'm not jogging. <laughs> I'm actually getting my med balls, my speed, my power. And I guess in some ways we could kind of slow it all down and say, okay, let's just do five of each. But I don't look at it and see the quality dropping off. Do you know what I mean? I don't look at it and think, wow. And what I'm going to try to do, it's interesting that you say this, you get me on so many crazy tangents, but, um, Chris Poirier is going to get me a bar sensei and bar sensei is another one of these velocity based training tools, but they also make a one that's a, a medicine ball. That's got a, uh, you know, basically an accelerometer in it. Okay. So it would be interesting to get that medicine ball and then say, all right, I'm going to do 10 throws and look at throws one through 10 and see, cause it kind of, if you look at like the Dan Baker velocity based training guidelines or Brian Mann's velocity based training guidelines, you, know, you might look at it and say, okay, do I want the throws to be, you know, when they drop below 80% of the hardest throw, is that when it's too low or is it when it's at 90%? And we kind of played around with that same idea on the Kaiser, you know, that you could just do your Kaiser with the power output and instead of worrying about loading, just look at, okay, here's my peak and then here's my percentage. And if I, once I can't get reps at 90, I'm going to stop. So, and that's where it, it, we're sort of intertwining now the conditioning piece and the velocity-based training piece. But I think the velocity-based training thing, and I just said this on the forum today to Elspeth Vino, I think is the next frontier. So I think that's probably the next area that we'll kind of wander into and start looking and thinking, okay, I got to get this bar sensei and get the bar sensei med ball and start figuring out how we can evaluate some of this stuff. Absolutely. And we even posted a video. Uh, Robert Yang had a video. He was teaching the snatch to kids um, about, and you were like, see, it's not about how heavy, it's about how fast. Exactly. Right? And, and that the problem is now people want to know, okay, how fast. And that, I remember, when, do you remember when you had Brian Mann on one of the things that Brian talked about the fact that the way they were cleaning didn't tend to transfer to vertical jump. And what he said is because they didn't clean well. They weren't cleaning fast enough. It wasn't really, you know, it was sort of like a semi-explosive exercise as opposed to an explosive exercise. Because, again, when you look at like Robert, I think they were, they might have been Robert's kids actually. I'm not sure. I think sure. it might have been, yeah. One of them was, at least. And, uh, I mean, they were flipping that bar like, boom. I mean, it was a nice, and, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize with the kids, you know, when we're teaching cleans, when we're teaching snatches, I tell everybody all the time, all I care about is how fast the bar moves. I don't care what's on the bar. And the truth is we do care what's on the bar. We want the, what's on the bar to continue to increase, but not at the expense of it moving at the rate that we want it to move at. Yeah. And, and it's, it is one of those things, obviously being in the golf world, we always said that, that, that thing happens way too fast for you. I mean, you think you're seeing what you're seeing, but once you start getting those numbers, Sometimes uh, it's not, you know, like like case in point, complete sports conditioning. I mean, you're looking at these guys who all look like they're in great shape. And then I was like, who, which ones? I wish you would have pointed them out. Because <laughs> I was like, whose heart rate is at, you know, 270 right now? At, yeah. Uh, warming up. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because you say, you know, you, you don't realize what you don't see. I think I sent you some of those. I know I Instagrammed some slow-mo videos of Mark and Michaela cleaning. I don't know if we put them up on Strength Coach or not, but I put them up on Instagram. And it's amazing that they get off the ground, which, you know, if you'd said to me, do they get off the ground when they're doing this? I'd like, no, no way. The weight's too heavy for them to actually have the whole system leave the ground, the weight, the barbell, you know what I mean, the person. Yeah. And – and they do in both of them, both filming, both of them doing cleans. There's this, there's a point in time when they are literally in, not in contact with the floor, but it's happening so fast that you don't really see that. Yeah. Yeah. See, we think we know. Um, Coach, just go, I want to talk about really quick about what you feel like the benefits are for this. Uh, um, Jason Spray 
uh, had done this uh, exercise where he was doing a rear foot elevated split squat and his back foot was on a band. Just talk to me, like, what, what is it about this that you feel like you're, you're getting, we're getting uh, extra work from? In truth, really simply, one, people always talk about, you know, I don't have stands, I don't have enough benches. And the other thing that you get is you've got some of these people saying, I'm running out of dumbbell weight. And so you probably have three separate things that come into play. One, a little bit unstable, a little bit more emphasis or a lot more emphasis on the front leg because pushing down the back leg doesn't do anything except stretch the band. So that becomes a plus as opposed to a minus, right? Yeah. Two, the setup. Like let's just say you're Jason, you know, you want it to be your light lower body day and you're using your benches for dumbbell inclines nobody's in your squat racks and you think, okay, I can, I can string some bands across all my squat racks and use those for split squats. So, you know, in a, in a higher volume place like ours or collegiate setting, it might give you the opportunity to do the exercise when you otherwise might not normally be able to do it. And then there's also the fact that it is, it makes, you know, there's a little bit, not, and again, I keep saying a little bit, but I actually a large change in the stress on the front leg, because that back foot is now, instead of it being, I always say like the outrigger on a canoe, you've now got something that's moving, which doesn't allow you to, to use that back foot in the way that you might be used to using it. So I guess, you know, it's another one of these variety tools. I wouldn't look at it if someone said, is that the best way to do it? I'd be like, no, absolutely not. Buy the stand from Perform Better and do regular rear foot elevated split squats. But if someone said like uh, Matt that was on the forum the other day, my guys are, you know, they're, they're killing the hundreds and that's the heaviest dumbbell that I had. I might be like, OK, you know, try the band and go back to 50s and see how they do. Absolutely. We from stress. So I think I, so I guess there's a bunch of possibilities there. Yeah. And you're you're basically you're a good advertising man. You're you're answering the objections uh, ahead of time. So good stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, great stuff. All right, coach. Well, uh, we're going to let you go. I mean, uh, complete sports conditioning has been, uh, on a tear. We're getting some such great feedback all over social media. Um, and, and I'm sure as people have a little bit more time, cause it is, it is, uh, takes, takes a little bit of time to, to watch this thing. Uh, we're going to be getting some more questions. So we'll probably keep continuing this discussion, but, uh, uh, great job again on that product. And, uh, thanks for coming on. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. As I said to you, I was a little bit nervous because it, it was, I felt a little bit out of my comfort zone. I wouldn't have said, hey, I'm, uh, you know, I've always thought of myself more as a, I guess, as a strength coach, as a speed coach, as a power coach, and and probably not a conditioning expert, yet doing the kind of the homework necessary to, to put that out there was really good for me. So it's it's been it, it's like a kind of double bonus situation for me in the, in the fact that people are liking it and are buying it and that it really made me examine a lot of the things that we were doing and maybe learn some stuff that I wouldn't have learned if I hadn't done it. So pretty much pretty positive all the way around. Hi, I'm Dr. Kyle Kiesel and I'm here to talk about how we use the FMS for injury prediction. You know, it's been 10 years since we published the first study looking at FMS in injury, and I just want to take a few minutes to take you through the path that we've gone using the FMS and now many other tools to help us with injury uh, pr prediction and prevention. The very first study we did was a small sample in professional football, and we just found a cut score on the FMS that separated those that got injured and didn't get injured. That injury definition wasn't ideal, it wasn't the best study, it was really just simply pilot data for us to say, you know what, there's enough here in the FMS to keep looking. So we went to a much larger study, a larger sample, still in professional football, and we found that the cut score that we established in the first study held up, and also we found in that study that asymmetry, a right-left difference, was predictive as well. Now, None of these were strong enough by themselves to say we've got a one-off tool for injury prediction. That's not what it was for. It was to figure out what variables really should go into a larger model. So we got to a, a larger college study and we put everything together. And what we found was the FMS, pass-fail, asymmetry. We added things from the Y-balance test 
and we looked at previous injury and even pain with movement. Putting those things together, we were able to say, listen, if you have multiple factors, you're in a high risk category. So we're able to take athletes and categorize them high risk versus low risk. So we did that in college. We then took that same concept out to a large military study. And what we found in the military study, looking at soldiers going forward prospectively for one year, we looked at 86 different questions. We looked at 29 different movements. So we had a lot of variables to look at. And what we found was the more risk factors you had, of course, the more likely you were to be injured. We found some pretty neat things. One of the big ones was dorsiflexion range of motion in and of itself, closed chain, a five degree difference, five degree right to left difference was a risk factor all by itself. Upper quarter and lower quarter, YBT. Various results from there was part of the model as well. And then we found interesting, not just previous injury, have you been hurt or not, but what's your self-recovery? How do you report yourself recovered? And believe it or not, you had to be over 92 and a half recovered on a 100 point scale, meaning 100's I'm perfect. Anything below 92 and a half was a predictor. So not just I feel pretty good, these people have to feel almost perfect or they're still at risk for injury. And the other big one here was simply pain with any of our movements. Most risk studies don't even consider pain with movement. Heck, you're already hurt. <laughs> so what we proved there was if you have pain with movement, you're gonna lose time in the next year. So that's really our path of how we utilize the FMS from the very beginning 10 years ago, all the way up through now, how we put multiple factors together to identify an athlete's risk for injury. For more information, visit functionalmovement.com. Cosgrove with the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Today we're going to talk about managing money when we're running our business. And this is a, you know, one of those topics that you may avoid. If, uh, you know, a lot of us fitness professionals, sometimes money is not one of our favorite things because we love what we do. We do it for free. And really, we do it out of passion. We don't do it for the money. So, um, but as you do open your business and run your, you know, or running a business, you have to get comfortable with talking about money. So we're going to talk about money. Uh, so first things first, you have to have a basic understanding of money and, and really be ready to face your fears of money. Um, you know, what did you grow up with that maybe you were told throughout your lifetime about money that, um, that may still be in your subconscious, you know, whether that's, um, you know, that, um, money is the root of all evil. You know, we've all heard all of these things. Um, so what are some of those fears that you, you know, you may have that may be holding you back? So, you know, really, um, get clear with yourself and think about that. Think about what are my fears around money? Um, do you have a healthy money mindset? You know, these are really the basics, the basics of money before we get even get into, um, you know, talking about managing money when it comes to running our business. So, um, you know, any fears you have, um, do you have a healthy mindset? And then, you know, really uh, an abundance mindset, realizing that, you know, there's enough for everybody and that, um, you know, by you doing a great job and by you offering services that are changing people's lives, you absolutely deserve to be compensated well and that um, that's okay <laughs> and that there's enough for everybody and that just because you're being compensated well doesn't mean that somebody else isn't, you know, it's not like you're taking money away from somebody. It's an abundance mindset. So there's Plenty for everybody. And so I'm um, really, you know, if you don't have that basic understanding of money and if your mindset around money is not in a healthy place, um, I would definitely think about, you know, starting to seek out some resources to shift that mindset, shift that mindset to an abundance mindset, because as you head into your business, you have to have that abundance mindset and you have to, you know, really be okay about talking about money and, um, and overcome those fears. So as we're running our business and managing money when it comes to running our business, there's some definitely tools that we want to take advantage of. Uh, you know, as you are building your clientele, a lot of you, I know, we, I always think we always think about trainers are good with numbers. You just may not be good with money numbers. So, uh, you know, you're good with numbers when it comes to how much weight is on the bar, right? If you have a 45 pound bar and you put two 45 pound plates on, you know exactly how much weight that is. Uh, you probably know and to the, to the decimal point, um, you know, the body fat percentages that your clients have lost or, um, you know, amount of muscle they've gained or fat they've lost. And, you know, these are all numbers. So it's just really shifting those, 
the focus of what numbers you're looking at to different numbers. And so some of the tools you'll want to use, um, definitely you got to think about a budget. And initially just, you know, you should have your own personal budget. If you haven't thought about your own personal budget of how much does it cost me to run my life, start there. You know, how much, how much is your own personal rent, groceries, you know, the things that it costs you to live your life. Um, start there. And uh, that's a good place to, to, you know, first get familiar with the budget. And then, you know, as we do look at our business, you know, what is our base operating expense? What, what does it cost to, um, you know, turn on the lights, to pay the rent, to, you know, all of these things? What, you know, what is that, um, what, that, what does that look like? Um, and then, you know, coming up with spreadsheets. So one of the tools that I use a lot is a spreadsheet and that way it's dynamic. Um, I do put, you know, formulas into the spreadsheet. And so getting familiar and comfortable with Excel, I think is a good idea, especially as a business owner and to um, create some of those budgets on a spreadsheet so that that way, you know, if I make a decision to give somebody a raise or I make a decision to, um, you know, add a new software program that's going to cost us a certain monthly expense, I can change that on my spreadsheet and I can see the effect that's going to have on my business. Because again, Again, business is dynamic. It's fluid. It's you're not going to have a rigid budget that's going to stay exactly the same month after month. So you want to have some tools um, such as spreadsheets that will work well. Profit and loss is something you want to get comfortable with and you want to look at monthly. So um, as you are running your business, whoever is doing your bookkeeping, um, if it's not you, make sure that you get a copy of the profit and loss each month so that you at least look at it and, uh, and start to get familiar with it and start to see what's happening and see if there's any money left over. And, um, if not, then, you know, we need to, we need to look deeper into that because, um, there, you know, goal is for a fitness business, a successful fitness business, we would like to see a 15 to 20% net profit. So at the end of the day, at the bottom line, we should see, you know, there should definitely be something left over each month. And if there's not, um, you want to start to look at that. Don't avoid it. Um, look at it <laughs> and start to figure out why. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, QuickBooks has always been my tool of choice as far as, um, bookkeeping goes and what we've used. So if you, if you're not familiar with QuickBooks, that's something to look into to, um, do your, your bookkeeping on most, um, you know, softwares and different, even if you're using a different credit card, uh, you know, we'll, we'll integrate with it easily. So, and then it has all kinds of great reports, budgets, things you can put in there. So definitely check out QuickBooks. And then just to uh, finish up this segment, um, two of the biggest expenses that I do want to bring up, um, in your business, there are two expenses that are always going to be your biggest and it's always going to be your rent and payroll. And so first things first, make sure that when you do negotiate your rent, you think about that because once you sign that dotted line and you are, you are paying that rent for the next five years, that can make or break your business. So really make sure that you, you know, that rent is something that's, um, you know, a number that makes sense with your business plan and your business model. Um, and then payroll is the one that, you know, that can get out of, out of hand, especially as we start to build our team. And so we really want to make sure that you know, when we are building our team, we are using that payroll, that budget to bring people on board that are going to be key players that are going to, we call it, you know, really they should be self-funding, right? They should actually help us to make more money. So um, they shouldn't actually cost you anything if they're actually doing, you know, they're they're actually helping to create that bigger picture. So, um, so just keep an eye on those two expenses because those will always be your biggest expenses. So next week I'm going to talk about some foundational numbers. So uh, tune in next week and we'll talk about, you know, some of those foundational numbers as we are managing our money when it comes to running our business. Thanks everybody for listening in uh, again, the Rachel Cosgrove results fitness university business of fitness segment, check out resultsfitnessuniversity.com for our upcoming events. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have on Mark Fitzgerald, who is the strength and conditioning coach for the Anaheim Ducks. It's, he's in his second year there. Mark, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Anthony. All right, well, I wanted to um, just start out with, I mean, we just talked about, I just said it's your second year with the Ducks. Um, and... Um, so you've had some time to reflect a little bit, but um, I want to talk about the transition of, you know, where you were. Um, wasn't like you weren't working with hockey players because you worked with the Marley, Toronto Marlies. You've been working with, with the OHL um, or CHL, right? CHL, was it? Yep. Oh, yeah, CHL. Um, so, you know, you, you, there's definitely some guys that you were going to go to the Ducks and you probably worked with them before. But, you know, when you're going into a new job, 
Um, I want you to talk about the uh, um, about how you approach that. And, um, you know, you got a guy, Sean Skane was there for 13 years. Um, so here you are, you're the new guy. There's guys that have been on that team forever. Um, so talk to me about the transition of, you know, kind of coming in, being the new guy and some, some of the things, the way you approached it. Yeah. You know what? It's, um, it's definitely one of the things I've talked about and, you know, having a lot of respect for Sean and, um, he was, he was good enough to, you know, when I, when I reached out to him and said, Hey, can we, can we chat? And, uh, he was gracious enough to, to do that and gave me some, you know, gave me some great info and some insight. And I don't think many people would have done that. So, you know, I think this, you know, shows the type of person that he is and, uh, and what have you. And we were, it's funny, we were speaking at the same event on the, that year, you know, and, um, I, I kind of said something in my, in my talk, just kind of recognizing him and, and just what a character guy that he was or that he is, sorry. And, um, you know, I guess that was, that was, uh, the way that it started. So I felt like it, it started off on a good note. Um, and like you said, I, I worked in hockey for a long time and, um, but you, you know, any, anytime you come into a new situation, it's going to be tough. You, you have to really, um, you want to set the precedent early as to, you know, what is it, what is expected of your program, you know, how your program is going to be different, different equipment, different, whatever. And again, it doesn't mean that the old one was bad or, or, you know, not, didn't work. It's just, it's new. Right. And I think because maybe, um, I did have some guys in the room that I knew, uh, that always helps, you know, so they're going to go in and they're, you know, the guys are going to ask about me and, and they're hopefully going to say good things and, and what have you and be supportive of me, which they did, which was nice. Um, but I think first and foremost, my, my mindset was on establishing trust. And I think, you know, how do I establish trust? Well, I'm going to show them that number one, I'm going to work hard, you know, and, and I'm going to come in, I'm going to change some things. Lots of things are going to change. And you know what, maybe some of the things didn't even need to be changed, but I felt like that was part of, you know, me being there was to put my stamp on some things, you know, bring in some new equipment, um, change up the rooms. Uh, you know, obviously, we have two training facilities, our practice rink and our game rink, and I'm actually still in the process of changing things over, uh, you know, just adding new things and, and what have you, uh, different tools, uh, you know, so I think there's a big part that comes with, you know, the sweeping change and like, yeah, there, there is going to be some change here, but at the end of the day, you're going to get someone who's, you know, going to make every decision based on what's best for the players and the performance of the players. And I think that's, uh, they saw that early. They saw that, you know, my work ethic of, you know, being at the rink on, you know, uh, being at the rink, the first guy in the morning, being one of the last guys there. And I think that's, you know, they see that and they see how, I think passion too. They, they see how passionate somebody is about coaching and what they do for a living. And, and it, and it kind of, um, it bleeds onto everybody else, you know? So I think establishing that trust and, and showing, you know, why you're there, uh, through your actions rather than just words is, 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 uh, was probably the things that I focused on the most. Yeah. And, and you had actually re- written an article for shrinkcoach.com called coaching full circle. And you were talking about, obviously trust, you know, being a delicate subject. Um, and it's, it's really hard the way you were explaining it in the article, just kind of trying to develop and cultivate relationships. But, you know, we also have a job to do just elaborate a little bit more on trying to be, uh, establish these relationships, but still, uh, create those boundaries. Yeah. You know what, that, that article, I don't write a lot. Um, I know I should probably write more and I'm, I'm planning on doing that, but, um, it came out of, uh, an experience, you know, our season was over and I had two of my athletes who, who were, um, just happened to be playing in California, one in Bakersfield and one in, uh, uh, I don't even know where the other one was playing at that point. Um, and they were in our backyard, we were having a barbecue and one of the guys had his wife, his wife and his, uh, new baby there. The other guy had his fiance there. So it was like, and they'd been with me for, you know, seven, eight years already. And it was like, you know, we, like I said in the article, we, we talked about training, but a lot more of it was just about life and, and, you know, kind of their individual next steps and their careers and where they're headed and marriages and kids and all that kind of stuff. And it kind of just, you know, made me realize how, 
you know, my job is, yeah, it's a, it's a coach. It's to push in the weight room and all that kind of stuff is to support them nutritionally and through injuries and all that kind of stuff. But really it's, I don't know. I, I think it's such a cool position to be in because you, you get to really be a mentor. You get to be a, uh, you know, someone that they're going to call on for advice. And, um, you know, I, I think it's so much more than what goes on in the 60 minutes in a weight room, you know, and I think that's how I've always looked at it anyways. And I think, you know, there's, if you have that trust outside of the weight room, they're never going to question, well, not never, but they're less than likely to question what we're doing in the weight room, you know? And I, I think, again, it's little things like they see me upping my education, going to conferences, you know, having, having guys visit our facility and teach our staff, you know? And, and so that part is kind of easier to sell them on, you know, the, Hey, the X's and O's of it, we know what we're doing. But the trust stuff is is massive, you know, and I think it's also some humility in there, too, because, you know, I had one of my guys move to California for the summer and he wasn't going to train with me, you know, and I said, hey, I'll, I'll, I can give you programs, you know, I can do the pen and paper stuff. But I really believe that the value of me personally is me being with you. So let's try and find a good coach for, you know, to, to be with you personally. And, and I, I went out and found him a coach. Uh, that he now still has a relationship with. And I think that's, you know, a lot of guys will say, well, like, oh, you should have just, you know, you, you lost the business. I'm like, yeah, maybe I lost a little bit of money, you know, for one summer. But that that the trust just went through the roof because I'm, I'm giving my athlete away to another coach. But again, and, you know, in, in the way that I look at it, the X's and O's between good coaches aren't that dissimilar. And I think that's a, you know, straight out of Mike Boyle's mouth is, you know, if you looked in the window and saw things, if you looked in my gym compared to a lot of other good coaches, I think you're not going to see that much discrepancy. You're going to see a lot of good coaching and you're going to see a lot of basics done really, really well. Um, you know, so I felt good about that. And I think that just helps, you know, uh, ensure the trust and realize that every decision that we're going to make is for the best of that athlete. And I think, you know, sitting around that, you know, my in the backyard and for the barbecue and stuff was just an eye opener. And I think I went and wrote the article that night after they left because it was just like, I couldn't hold it in. You know, it was like, this is what coaching is about. This is what, you know, building relationships. And I call both those guys friends now, but we, we also have that different side of the relationship where when they come in the gym in the morning, it's, yeah, there's small talk and there's whatever, but we get to work. You know, I think it actually even helps when it comes to pushing because they, they just, they trust, they know that what I'm asking them to do is the right stuff and it's going to help them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you could be honest with them, then, which is yeah. such a huge piece of it. You really need to be honest because I mean, you're doing your job. Like you said, you need to call them out for poor recovery habits or make them accountable for their careers. So. Yeah. You know what? And I think, like you said, it's, um, they, they, they don't question it and I, and I, and I can call them on their bullshit too. And one instance and one guy who was, he was doing extra, you know, cause he's that kind of guy and he's running stairs at night or something like that. And he comes, he comes into the gym the one morning and he looks like death. I said, what are you doing? He's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I just, you know, I just doing some extra stairs at night. I said, no, man, if you're going to do that, I'm not training you because you're going against what we're trying to do and you look exhausted. We're not going to get the good, you know what I mean? So it's just that relationship helps me call them out if, if need be, you know, and say, Hey, no, you're going to, you're going to follow the program or you're, or you're not, you know, and it's the response was right because he knew that I was looking for his, looking out for his best interest. Love it. Yeah. It's funny. I've read a quote from you too. Uh, and we're going to talk about some technology in a minute, but there's also you know, you, you know, the experience and you have to be watching all the time. You quoted, uh, I was quoted. I find the visual assessment can tell you a lot about their last 24 hours, complexion, body language. And of course the eyes are great indicators of good or poor choices as it's related to recover. I actually just was thinking, yeah, he was drinking that, you know, like if somebody was out yeah. partying, but you know, there's other things like that, that are, you know, he means well, but you have to, be watching all the time yeah and i think that's so true and then that instance alone that guy you, you could see it in his face you could see it in his his skin just didn't look right and his eyes looked tired and he just looked 
you know, wired but tired, you know, and there's there's there wasn't good a good vibe coming from them. And I know that sounds, you know, uh, weird or whatever, but when you've been doing this a lot long enough and you watch athletes walk in your doors, you just the analysis starts right right away. It's either like, okay, we're gonna have a good productive day or I'm gonna have to have a conversation with this athlete. Love it. Uh, Mark, let's talk about the technology. Um, you know, there's different types of coaches. Uh, you know, some guys are scared of the technology. Some people depend on it too much, right? That's the pendulum. Um, talk to us about where you are and how you use, what technology you use and how you use it. Yeah, you know what? Technology is, it's, it's in our field, whether we like it or not. Um, I think there's a larger majority who are now, you know, accepting it and, and, you know, utilizing it in some way, shape or form. I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's too valuable not to use it. And I'm a pretty simplistic coach, I think, you know, nuts and bolts. You know, we're going to do the basics really, really well. Same with nutrition. You know, there's no, there's no magic pills that you can take. And if there are, then sign me up. But um, there isn't, it's just work and consistency and, and, you know, doing the little things as we, all those cliches, but they're all true. Um, but what I think what technology allows us is to, you know, make better decisions, you know, and you know, yeah, the coach's eye, nothing replaces that. But if what you see can be, um, you know, can, can, can be reaffirmed through technology, then why not? You just have, it's more for, you know, trusting your gut. Yeah. But if, if your gut feeling can be backed up with, you know, relevant technology, then I think that helps us in our jobs, you know, and I think a lot of people are, or a lot of coaches, sorry, are, are a little hesitant with it because they don't maybe understand it. But if you work with the right companies and, and you can understand the data and make sense for you and then take that data and then make it make sense for the, the sport people or the hockey people in my case, uh, it, it becomes really valuable. And, and I think that's, that's what I'm trying to build. Uh, you know, year one was a bit of a, uh, a little bit crazy just with so many things going on. And obviously part of my saying yes to coming to Anaheim was, you know, that they're, they would have to make an investment in technology because they weren't really using any. And I said, you know, I'm going to bring this with me. It's going to help, um, in what I want to do. And I think at the end of the day, when I look at technology and hockey, it's assessing player readiness and full stop. Uh, it's not going to tell me, uh, you know, who's better than the other guy. It's in my opinion, it's assessing readiness. And I think that's a huge tool, um, in our game with our schedule and, um, you know, the, especially this year with the condensed schedule, um, you know, it becomes super valuable if you know how to use it properly. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think it's, um, it's, it's here and it's not going anywhere. So in my, in my head, it's like, how can I utilize it? How can I make it work for me? You know? Yeah. Or what are you using to assess player readiness? Yeah. You know, so we have a couple of different tools. Um, we're using a, a Zephyr system for our on ice tracking. Um, so Zephyr, I met them through, I do some consulting work for Under Armour and I met them at the NFL combine years ago. And, uh, I sat, I went out to dinner with one of their engineers and just blew me away with the stuff that they were able to capture. And I would, you know, I would be lying if I said, if I said I understood it all at the time he was telling it and maybe not even to this day, do I understand all of it, but I know now what I'm looking at, you know, so every practice that we have, our guys will get, uh, either wear a shirt, like an Under Armour type of shirt or a chest strap, you know, whatever they prefer. And it'll, it'll give me a practice report as soon as they're off the ice and, you know, kind of what we did in that practice or what, what was the effect of that practice. And, um, so that's one key. Uh, we use some sleep monitoring devices. Um, and those ones are a little bit tougher because the players obviously don't have to wear them. Um, but we do it a few times a year and we're able to get some pretty good info. Um, we do some force plate work, um, on a really, on a weekly basis, uh, three different types of jumps, just looking for, you know, we're matching that up with our, um, on ice and we're all the other metrics that we have just to looking for fatigue. We're looking for, you know, where their strength curve is at and, uh, how they're progressing or regressing throughout the season where we can kind of make changes or what have you to their, to their training. Um, those are probably the, the biggest tools that we use, um, as far as technology wise, 
obviously we do our you know um, heart rate stuff post game and but those are that's kind of you know pretty simple but those are probably our, our, our biggest tools right now and it really gives me um, you know some great information we have some other little things that we do too but I mean I think you know we use watt bikes and we will do some um, weekly sprint tests on those just to see how they compare to the training camp tests our body fat obviously we're partnered with a, a university university locally uh, in California that helps us administer that so it's I think we got a pretty good picture I think you know it's always changing always looking to add new things or you know see what's out there but I think those are the those are going to be the consistent ones absolutely what about um this idea of buying again you're the new guy okay they knew you were coming in with that but it's not just buying from management it's buying from players then there's extra time there's education just talk about that piece of of it like the 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 integration and the buy-in and the education of it yeah you know what i i think and i've had other coaches in the league ask me like hey how, how did you get the guys to do that and i said well you know i asked them number one i think you know giving them the choice and which is a, a choice that they have you know and they can say no i think i, I rarely get guys that say no to wearing a, this or jumping for me or doing any of that stuff um but it does happen again again i don't think it's happened this year but um i think it's one of those things where these guys are so competitive as you know they they just want to see what we're collecting you know so i've been very open with with our information and you know, we give player report cards um, probably monthly. You know, if they ever want to see what, you know, hey, what I do in practice today, it's, hey, come on in my office, pull it up, I'll show you, I'll talk you through it, you know, why you were here and, and this, what does this mean? Um, and they've been great because they know that if if they have a question about what, what I'm doing and, and they want to see what they did, they know that my office is open and they can come ask me. You know, and I think that's a huge part of it where – you know, this could be just rumors, but you hear about teams that just, you know, they put their heart rate monitors on, they take them off and they don't tell you what you did and they don't give you any, any information. They don't really give you a choice. And I think that's wrong. I think that's the athletes want to know. And I think that's, that's where you get a chance to educate. It's, that's where you get a chance to gain trust. That's where you get a chance to build a relationship with an athlete. Hey, this is, you know, you, you look tired today. You know, here's why I thought you looked tired. And, you know, it could just open up more conversations. Some guys aren't, you know, always open to those types of conversations. So if it gives you time alone with a player that you can, again, build a relationship, I think that's great. And I think that's a big reason why I did get a lot of buy-in was that I was open to the information and I, they were, it was accessible to them. Yeah, good stuff. Well, let's keep, let's stay on this because you're doing your, you're actually doing your master's um, on, on data, right. And hockey testing. Talk to us about yeah, that. That's, yeah. That's, um, you know, I got three kids at home and my wife was shaking my head at me when I said I was <laughs> going to do this, but, um, I figure they're, they're young now, so there's no other real time. If I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. Um, do your masters young kids. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm excited for it because um, we got a great partner in um, Dr. Scott Lynn at Cal State Fullerton, who's actually a Canadian guy, um, whose brother I worked with in Toronto. Which small world, the hockey world is tiny, um, you know. So when I hooked up with him, we do all our testing there on on site, uh, and he helps me throughout the year with some stuff. And um, you know, it was it's just something that's in my wheelhouse and something that I don't think that we really nailed, you know, as a as a as a league or as a sport in general, like you get the NFL combine, it's the, the data for that and the testing they do, whether you like it or not, it's, it's, it has value, you know, it has merit. And, uh, I don't think we have that for hockey yet, you know, and I think there's too many, too many discrepancies in, in what, in how we test. And I think this, you know, hopefully with the research that I can get done with some really smart people that we can really, at the end of the day say hey these are the tests that mean something in hockey and these are the tests that actually will you know support um strength coaches and and this is these are the tests that should be being done at every level you know and that's that's my goal for doing it and i think um there's no better time for me to do it while i'm have access to you know in the nhl and um you know with with ets on the side having you know minor hockey and junior hockey 
mean, we have all sorts of data collection points, so it's <clears throat> it's either now or never. Very cool. I'll just remind, uh, tell everybody, ETS is uh, your your facility in Whippy in, in Canada. So um, just so everybody knows. Um, so what are we? What are you finding? I mean, you know, like with the combines too. Obviously, this is going to be a big deal for for the combines and try to get to evaluate like what you were talking. You and I were talking about off off uh, recording was evaluating hockey talent versus athleticism, right? So just expand on how this is going to hopefully uh, um, affect the combine. Yeah, I mean, I, I think again, I, I know nothing about hockey talent. You know, I'm not a hockey coach. Um, I'm an athletic coach, you know, and I think, um, I think that's something that we need to, as a, you know, as a group really need to continue to focus on is that when I'm doing testing at any level, I'm, I'm testing for athleticism. I'm going to try and pull out the best athlete and give you the best athlete because, you know, I, I shouldn't, in my opinion, I shouldn't be evaluating hockey talent necessarily. It's athleticism and athletic abilities that I'm evaluating. So, you know, there's, I think we're better. Like, I think the guys that have um, been working on the combine uh, on the NHL side have done a fantastic job. It's night and day from what it was. And, um, you know, kudos to them for that continuation of that. And I want to be a part of that too, which now that I am, um, you know, it's really, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really drilling down into, you know, what are those specific tests? What are those specific um, markers that we're looking for as strength and conditioning professionals that that's going to give us the power to say, hey, this kid jumped this, he sprinted this, he's our best athlete in this group. And then you go to the hockey people and say, can he play hockey? And they say, yes, he's got hockey sense, he's got this and that. I'm like, okay, well, the physical attributes are there the hockey skill or whatever is there, this, there's a lot of upside to this athlete. It, it could mean the difference between drafting, you know, really well or really poorly. <clears throat> and I think I've seen it in both ways where, you know, you get a kid in junior who, who's got, you know, 40 or 50 goals and all these points, but then you, you assess him off the ice and, you know, it doesn't really match up. And I think, you know, the old way of, you know, you don't score goals from the weight room. Yeah, of course you don't. But if you can match athleticism with some hockey sense and, you know, the, a base talent, I think you got a lot of upside to work with there. And, you know, you, you put them in an NHL environment with these great coaches and what have you, then there's a lot more upside than somebody who has, you know, a lot of points in junior, but physically is not going to be able to handle the demands of the NHL. You know, so I think there's... Um, it's come a long way and it's going to continue to evolve in my opinion, as we involve more technology, as we, you know, really start to drill down into why, you know, why do we test this way? And, uh, you know, because we've always done it before is not a good enough answer for me. And it's something that I'm you know, going to continue to push. What are, is there anything you can kind of give us like in terms of specific tests, like basically things that you're, you're got, you're finding are good, uh, good evaluation for for athleticism and and things that you know like what we were talking. You said like not there's no weightlifting tests like they're not going to tell us that much. So give us uh, an idea of like some good and some of the quote unquote bad. Yeah, and and you know what it, it's bad depending on who you are. You know that's just my opinion. But if if I'm doing a weightlifting test to on a hockey player, I think I'm doing him a disservice. You know what I mean? I, I if I'm gonna bring somebody into camp who's never trained with me and say, hey, put as much weight on your back as you can and, and see what you can do, then that's, I don't know, that's a recipe for disaster. And it's, the risk reward for me is too high. Um, and even with somebody that I have trained, it's, you know, why would I do a weightlifting test for hockey? I, again, I'm, I'm trying to pull out athleticism. So I'm looking at vertical jump, broad jump, single leg jump. Um, I'm looking at, you know, the 5'10'5, five, can you accelerate, decelerate, change direction? That's all hockey is. That's all sport is really, but you know, that's, it's, it's how do you, how do you move in space and are you, can you create power, you know? And the, I think that's, you know, that's the kind of profile that I'm looking for because that's going to tell me a lot about your, uh, your future or your, um, uh, you know, your ability to improve. Whereas, you know, if you can, you can squat X amount, but it looks terrible and, you know, you see all sorts of faults going on and, you know, that's, that has a ceiling. And we, you know, I think some type of screen is still really valuable. We do a, you know, modified FMS with a couple other little things uh, in the duct system. But, 
Um, I think it's, you know, every coach is going to be a little bit different, which I think is great. Um, but I still think that there is a, you know, a small package of tests that everybody should be doing. And I don't have that package just yet. Like it's not, it's not there yet, but it's, that's my goal is that you, you can do other tests for sure. But, you know, if it's these six ones, they're, they're the ones that are really going to tell us about hockey. You know, if you have, a, and I, we, I did this in the CHL where, you know, there was a, so much discrepancy, you know, some, te- some teams were doing five mile runs and some teams were doing, you know, bench press and, you know, whatever it was, it was, it was a disaster. And we originally, we, we initially started with, okay, there's three tests that we want everybody to do and we want the results. And you know, we don't care about kids' names and stuff like that. It's just more about the, the raw data. And it helped us a ton, you know, because we could start to see patterns in, in the players that were performing on the ice and, um, you know, who we were looking for and why. And we can see the teams that were doing those long runs and stuff and their injury rates and all that kind of stuff. And as you can imagine, you know, the teams doing long runs and, and punishing their athletes, I mean, their performances weren't good, you know, and the teams that were doing things properly and, and training and resting and nutrition and what have you, they, their records showed, um, you know, so it's, I still think there's the battery is coming, but it's again, more, uh, weighted on the athleticism side as opposed to weightlifting. And, um, you know, because a lot of these guys, shoulder injuries and, um, hips and whatever, <clears throat> you wouldn't want them under load. You wouldn't want them trying to, you know, what's one day of weightlifting testing going to tell you about, you know, 82 game season i I just think it's i don't know it's definitely something that's not in my program yeah it's funny just got off the phone with coach boyle his product came out uh last week or monday um and he was talking about just working with his son a little bit too and he doesn't really have the data on the younger kids but you're probably in a pretty good position uh having the facility uh, having ETS and 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 being able to kind of collect some of this, you know, and and seeing these kids go from, uh, from you know, right before junior into junior and then into uh, you know, whatever if it is if it is a pro, uh, pro position, but uh, you're able to kind of track through the years. Or you have you been working with some of the, uh, uh, you know, I know you're doing it there, uh, you know, in California, but have you been getting some data on the younger kids as well? Same. Yeah. Data? Yeah, back home, uh, ETS is responsible for um, Whippy Minor Hockey, <clears throat> which is um, about a thousand kids. Um, Whippy is a pretty crazy hockey town, um, you know. So we're we're gathering data on those kids all the time. Just and the program that we've implemented isn't one of you know weightlifting. It's one of movement. It's sprinting, jumping, throwing. You know, it's just good movement outside of what you know on the ice. I mean, Whippy is a little crazy because. You know, for a town of 140,000 people, there's like 12 hockey rinks, you know, so it's nice. Yeah. Nice if you're a hockey player. But um, if you're trying to preach about or not preach, but if you're trying to speak about athletic development and whatever, you got nine year olds who are on the ice six, seven days a week. You know, it's it that that doesn't help them. You know, it's and amazing I think our program we- is. Yeah, it's amazing that we even have to say that, right? I mean, if you really think about the, some of the stuff you just said, it was pretty much like about athleticism, and we shouldn't even have to say that, right? Uh, we shouldn't, but, you know, yeah. even I, speaking at a couple of conferences last summer, and um, <clears throat> the ones that I did speak at, they asked me to talk about, you know, long-term athletic development, and, you know, I'd get to the point about, you know, it was hockey-focused, obviously, and i get to that point about being on the ice, and you get almost, like, half the room a little less than half and the coaches are nodding their heads and agreeing with me and you get the other just over half that aren't doing anything and you know you're they're not agreeing with me and it's like well here's my resume here's yours and I'm not one of those guys and I'm not trying to be arrogant but it's like you almost want to say that like hey here's the level that I work at here's who I've worked with here's my opinion on this but they still don't want to do it because they don't know what else to do they want to just be on the ice you know and I think that's ultimately going to hurt our sport but uh i know there's lots of good coaches out there that are you know speaking that same speak you know what i mean and i think that's going to help for sure and i think you know usa hockey is doing a great job of you know they're I, i've gotten to see it now they're 
their uh, off ice program and their development program, which is great. And I know Hockey Canada is uh, like right along those same lines. So I'm sure it'll change, but it's it's we're in one right now. We're in the middle of it uh, yeah. as far as you know that education piece, which is again lots of great coaches who are speaking that message. But I still think it's going to be a tough one. Yep, good stuff. Uh, Mark, let's talk a little bit about nutrition. I know it's something that you really have been implementing as well. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously being, uh, you know, if, if people don't know the NHL, but you know, the ducks have a super amount of travel, uh, <laughs> because of the location. Um, you know, the only, the only good, you know, short trip is to, is over to LA right down the street. But um, but you guys are always flying. Nutrition is obviously going to be super important for your recovery. Talk to us about some of the things you've implemented there and, and what you're doing with that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably one of the biggest factors that we can control and control in a good way. And I think um, that was a big change that I made as well, you know, coming in. And I think a lot of the guys knew that because they knew my background and um, – you know, I think just quality of food and, you know, this is the never hungry league. So there's always food around, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's good food, you know, and I think educate again, I think it comes from an education piece too. You can, you can really take the, the opportunity to educate the players on why, you know, and why we're eating this way, why we're eating that way. And, um, you know, just by the, the food choices that you put in the room, the food choices that you put on the plane, you know, I changed our plane pretty significantly as to what we offer and who the providers are and even the snack baskets, you know, like, and, and even with our coaches too, who have been really good about, um, you know, helping me out in that regard, you know, most of our staff, all of our staff works out, you know, they try to stay healthy as best they can. And, um, like I mentioned off air, like if, if you're not, staying healthy and, and taking care of yourself even as a coach in this league you're going to be in one because it's the travel and the different especially for us it's 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 a lot you know and if you're not healthy then you're going to suffer you know so I think it, again it comes with trust it comes with um, um, realizing that you know um, taking supplements and, and supplementing properly is, is part of being a pro athlete and it's even more important for us when we fly uh, so w- with our travel schedule. So the guys have been great because they, they notice the difference. They notice the difference with good supplements and supplementing properly. They notice the difference with well-timed meals and, and well put together meals. Uh, and when we have, you know, team meals or, you know, our pregame meals and stuff like that, they, they know they're going to get good food, you know? So we never, we hardly ever leave a room with, with food on the table. All the guys are eating, which is, which is fantastic. Keeps our body fat down, it keeps our weight under control. You know, it just, it makes my job a lot easier. The fact that the, the buy-in of, of good eating is there. Mark, what's the body fat you like guys to be at? Uh, it really depends. Like I think healthy for the NHL is somewhere around, you know, nine and 11, nine to 11. Um, you know, we got some bigger guys, um, who are, you know, over 10 a little bit maybe, but most of the guys are under that 10, marker (coughs) excuse me um you know so i think that's a pretty healthy just because of the travel and just because of the um um you know the the opportunities that we do have to lift and you know i guess the lifestyle if you want to call it that um i think that's a pretty healthy number i think once you start dipping below you know seven um you get into some other issues that that could come up um whether it's uh you know, losing some muscle or being depleted of energy, what have you. I think that that sweet spot is right between that eight and 10 uh, and can come up to 11 a little bit depending on the guy. But I think hockey guys now more than ever are leaner. Um, They're fit, you know, 365 days a year. You know, so that I think the body fat thing is becoming less and less of an issue. Any technology that you're using for, um, are you tracking uh, in the beginning? What are you doing for, uh, in terms of technology with nutrition? Uh, you know what we use at the start, we used, um, because of my connection with Under Armour, we use my fitness pal. Um, they have a really good um, nutrition tracker on there. Um, but you know what, for me, for the, the tracking stuff, food journaling is just as easy, you know, and it's, I get the guys to take a picture of their meal and tell me what the contents of it and what time they ate it at. And that still works. You know, like I, 
I, yeah. I don't think, you know, it's old school or whatever. And I get a lot of text messages at, at meal times, but, um, I think it also, when you take a picture of what's in front of you, it, it kind of makes you, you know, realize what's in front of you, good or bad. You know, if, uh, if there's a lot of beige food on your plate or if there's a lot of, uh, you know, grease compiled on your plate, then maybe you're not making a great decision. Or if there's, if you can't even see your plate, maybe you're eating a little bit too much, you know, <laughs> it's, um, it's more like that, but we do use the, my fitness pal a little bit, um, but no, the nutrition stuff is more, it's day to day or it's, it's daily. It's, uh, you know, and I, I'm lucky again, our, our group is very, you know, they ask lots of questions, which I think is great. You know, why do we take this? Well, we take this because, and this, and you know, what foods are good when you're, you're, when you have a cold, you know, and I think our guys just are, are bought in now because I've established that trust and, and then I think they feel good, you know, and you know, because of, you know, when you eat properly, when you supplement properly, you generally are going to feel pretty good. You know, and um, I think the proof is in the pudding in that in that sense because they're they've seen that it works and they've seen how good they feel. I mean, I'm I'm getting text messages now. It's our day off here, and you know, half our team want you know workouts to do. And I think that speaks to you know our, our culture. You know, this is they want to prepare themselves for what we have ahead of us. You know, and I think that's a that's a great thing. Yeah, going back to the my fitness pal. You know the pitchers probably can get a little crazy. They're sending them to you. You get text all day, but um, but um, mm. but the Mind Fitness Pal is super easy to use, and mm. um, it, you know you put in a because uh, so many people have used it that once it gets logged in, it's it stays in there. So some you can find, and you know you don't need to do it every day. Uh, you can, no. I mean, it does help to kind of get a couple weeks in. Really helped me to kind of start to think a little bit more about it. So, um, and another another product we used too, I almost forgot, was uh, um, Renaissance Periodization Templates, mm -hmm. RP Templates, and those have been... What do those do? It's just a, you know, so you put in, um, I work with their guy and, you know, I give him a current body weight, you know, body weight that we want to get to, activity level, and they just fired me back, a, you know, a template of eating, you know, on a really active day, game day, off day, and it just really goes through... Uh, what to put in each meal, you know, got, kind of gives you some caloric um, um, boundaries for each meal. It, uh, you know, supplementation, whatever the case may be, it's all color coded. It has like a three page thing that you can, you print it all out and it shows you, you know, the size of a, you know, four ounces of protein looks like, you know, a deck of cards. And I've used that for all our prospects and I even use that for our NHL guys in the summertime and they love it because they just print it out, they put it on their fridge and, you know, it's nobody's going to eat perfectly, nor do I think they should. There's always a you know a balance of of you know Dairy Queen and and you know steak and asparagus. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. there's always. I don't think I want them to turn into any sort of you know fitness people. You know how you, how you can go down that path of unhealthy eating, but I want them to be. I want them to be conscious of what they're putting in their mouths. You know, I want them to be. I want them to think about what they're eating, but enjoy it at the same time. And I think the, the templates are really good because they just give you kind of guidelines. They're not telling you what specifically to eat. It's just guidelines. And <clears throat> again, that's where I can come in and say, "Hey, you know what some really good protein choices are?" Boom, 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 boom. You know, and again, it, it gives me a, an opportunity to educate and communicate with an athlete. Then that's that's why I do what I do. You know. Love it. Good stuff. What's the name of that again? Uh, RP Templates. RP Templates. Nice. Um, all right. Well, we've taken enough of your time. I know it's your day off, but uh, you got to enjoy those. And, uh, you know, you guys are uh, you're in uh, – right now, currently, you're in first place. Um, but, uh, but you know, you never know. You guys got a tight race over there. But um, good luck coming up. Uh, playoffs is nothing like the hockey playoffs. And, uh you got to be ready for them, and, and it sounds like you're doing your best to uh, to get these guys ready. So, Mark, we appreciate you coming on and talking all about your transition to, to working with the Ducks and some of the technology and coaching and, and nutrition. So uh, thanks so much for coming on and sharing. Yeah, thanks for having me, Anthony. Really appreciate it. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 204 of the Shrank Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Poyer, Aaron McGurn, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info. 
on their educational seminars. Don't forget right now they got the spend more, save more offer. 10% off you spend between 50 and 100. 15% off when you spend between 100 and 150. And 20% off when you spend 150 dollars or more some exclusions do apply so check it out don't forget to the orlando summit has the early bird pricing ending soon it will go from 289 to 359 so register now special thanks to coach boyle and mark Fitzgerald for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of shrink and conditioning nutrition and performance enhancement rachel cosgrove for the results fitness university business and fitness segment Check them out at ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Kyle Kiesel and Functional Movement System. Check them out at FunctionalMovement.com. And, of course, remember, you can try StrengthCoach.com out for three days. Just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to StrengthCoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name's Anthony Rennie. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.